Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you so much for having your people on Friday to give a glory unto you and to praise you and testify your goodness. And this time we want to open our hearts to receive your word and your truth because we know your truth will set us free. So would you speak to our hearts, Father? And would you give us a conviction, not that we may only hear your voice, but be able to really keep your word and obey your word and do your word. We thank you so much and we want to give all glory unto you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And also just on the top of it to, to remind us, that's why we do have a scroll of evangelism starting in October. So that we may be able to share the gospel to our local people in Southern California. So Joe, you can participate in the school of evangelism and our, uh, you can recruit all these uh, people. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's come so not only that we take the gospel to India but also be able to share the gospel to our friends to our family members and to our neighbors who do not know the name of Jesus Christ uh, now as we've been reading book of Judges and we already concluded the book of Judges according to the Bible time uh, portion um, and we began to read a book of Ruth, and the Ruth is also is uh, about the time during the Judges. Uh, but we want to go back and talk about uh, chapter 17. It's about a man named Micah. Now, I personally, if you ask me, what are the portions that you really don't like to read from the Bible? There are few stories from the Bible, I personally do not like to go and read it because there are some horrendous stories because the Bible is very transparent. Bible is very honest. God does not hide the sinfulness of human beings, wickedness of human beings. When a human being hits rock bottom, it becomes just so ugly and it becomes just so horrendous and so miserable, but God doesn't hide from us. And there are certain stories like uh, from Old Testament, is, uh, uh, Testament, especially there were a certain story about mothers eating their own babies, the flesh of their own infants. And it's recorded in the Bible. And I heard from certain sister when she read that portion as a baby Christian, she got so offended before God and she had a really hard time uh, trying to be able to worship God and so forth. A uh, uh, couple other stories in the Old Testament that I personally have a hard time reading these stories uh, written in the book of Judges, especially towards the end of the book of Judges, chapter 17 through 21. Now, to understand these stories, we are going to talk about it because everything that are written in the Bible, they are written for examples and they are written for our admonition. And we need to read the Bible entirely, holistically, that we should not leave anything out of the Bible. Some portions, uh, as God says, I love you, I will never forsake you, I will bless you. And we tend to absorb those and love to read it over and over again. But there are also passages like that, uh, do not be lukewarm, otherwise I will spew you out. That's the same Jesus is saying. If you do not repent, I will remove your candlestick. That's the same, the scripture. It's the same word from Jesus Christ who said, I will never forsake you, that I will be always with you. So holistically, as a Christians, need to read and meditate God's words. So as personally, as much as I dislike reading this is chapter 17 and the later chapters in the book of Judges, but there are lessons for us and we need to holistically uh, read it and, and meditate upon it because they give us admonition to all of us. Now to better understand chapter 17 and beyond as we know book of Judges is about the Israelites history right after the death of Joshua. 
The Joshua generation and his people, they worship the Lord. And they walk with God. And they were able to conquer the land of promise, the land of Canaan, by the help of God. But after Joshua died, the following generation, immediately they began to forsake God. And they began to worship the idols that God specifically destroy all the graven images, all the molten images, all the idols that Canaanites used to worship. You destroy them and never, never and compromise and learn from them. But immediately this emerging generation began to fall into idolatry and, and invoked wrath of God. And that's a story of the churches. And we know it's a vicious cycle. The people of Israel fell into, they fell into idolatry. Then they will receive a punishment from God. And in their agony, in their pain, they cry out unto the Lord. And God is a merciful. God will hear their prayers. And God will send a particular judge to deliver them. And then there's a peaceful era, prosperity. And then soon, they will fall into idolatry again. And vicious cycle they are going through. And then also God will elect a judge to deliver such a people. And the story of judges that we also have read are not that always awesome. Even though time to time they experienced victories, but their lives itself also portrays that vicious cycle. Gideon was one of them. Even though he was able to bring such mighty victory with only 300 men, but later on he made a golden effort and it caused the people whoring after these golden effort. It became sort of like an idol and invoked the wrath of God. And later on his descendants, 70 sons, uh, by conspiracy, all died because he uh, looked after, he chased after the lust of his eyes because he had many wives. Chapter was the same way. Samson, we talked about last week, was the same way. Now, so God talked about lives of judges and lives of the people. The history ended in the book of Judges, at least, with the story of Samson. Now, what we read and what we hear from chapter 17 is not chronological order of history of Israel. It's a sort of like a, we can understand it as an appendix. These are completely separate stories. And in fact, these are stories, two major stories, are very early stage of Israelite corruption. Because uh, we know there was a Phineas coming in. Phineas was a high priest. He was, he was a grandson of Aaron. And that, that means he was not after Samson. It was a, a very full early uh, stage. Right after Joshua died, he was uh, still alive. That means at the very early stage of Israel's corruption. Now, today, we are going to talk about a man named Micah. It's the same way. We don't know exactly what time that he lived, but we know it was also early stage. If until chapter 16, God used the stories of Judges, then 17 and beyond in the book of Judges, God reveals the life of Levites. Levites. Levite was chosen by God. So the, these particular group of people, they were scattered all over the land of Canaan because they did not receive inheritance from God. Inheritance was God himself. And at the same time, God gave them 48 different cities scattered all over the nation of Israel. And they were supposed to live among different tribes. Why? Because their role was to provide knowledge and the service of God to the people. The reason why I believe God puts this appendix to the end of the book of Judges is because God is revealing the spiritual condition of the Levites that has a reflection of entire people's lives. The reason, one of the reasons why Israelites began to corrupt and began to worship idol is because 
the Levites failed what they supposed to do towards God's people. The Levites were sort of like a today's clergy, pastors, the called people to minister God's people spiritually, to teach the Bible, teach the way of the Lord. But these Levites failed what they supposed to do, and then it has been reflected to the lives of entire Israelites, and they began to become corrupted and worship the idol and invoked wrath and the punishment of God. And that we can see this because there are two stories written from chapter 17, and the two Levites, they come forward. One is with a Micah. There was a particular man, Micah, uh, lived in the mountain Ephraim. So probably he was a, a tribe of Ephraim. But he stored 11, 11,000, was it 11,000, 1,100? 1,100 silvers from his mother. And after his mother lost these silver, he, she began to curse the man who stole it. Now, he was afraid of this, receiving this curse, so he confessed of his sin and brought the silver back to his mother. Then immediately the mother will begin to bless him. May God, Lord, bless you. But out of these 11,000, 100 silvers, 200 silvers, the mother will choose and will make a graven image and the molten image, idols they made, and they begin to worship them, and chose one of Micah's son as a priest. Now priest has to come from descendants of Aaron. No one other than Aaron's descendants can become a priest. But Micah, not being a Levite, or Aaron's descendants, will choose one of his sons as a priest. And then there was a particular young man who was a Levite coming from Bethlehem of Judah, traveling along and came to the house of Micah. And Micah finds out he's a Levite. Oh, why don't you become my spiritual father? And why don't you become priest of our house? And that's the story. So let's read from the book of, book of Judges, chapter 17, from verse 1 through six, and we will expound further and what kind of lessons God wants to teach us uh, from these stories. Book of Judges, chapter 17, verse one. And there was a man on Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had a wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an effort and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now, repeatedly that we will hear on verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did which was right in his own wise. As we know, to be a kingdom, we need a three or four components to create a kingdom. To be a kingdom, we need a people. And to be a kingdom, we need a territory, land. And also to be a kingdom, we need a king to rule over the people. And on the top of it, the king lays down the law for the people. So when the Bible says, in those days that there was no king in Israel, it means spiritually these people did not consider their God as their king because God wanted to be their king. So because there was no 
king. They did not consider their God as their king, as their ruler. Everyone did whatever seems to be right in their eyes. In other words, everyone did according to their emotion, according to their desire, whatever fits good for them, they did it. It was chaotic. There was no ruler. There was no God in the midst of their lives. And because they did not consider their God as their king, there was no law. And as we've been reading the book of Judges, that we can see the word of God, the law of God, is scarcely mentioned in any of these stories, and particularly from chapter 17 and on. And Micah and his mother, they wanted to receive God's blessings. So let's talk about Micah, this man. Why did he steal 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother? Because this man is led by the lust of his flesh. He loves the money. He's a covetous. And he stole the money from his mother. Then his mother invoked the curse upon the stealer. And then he brings back because he doesn't want to be cursed. He wants to be blessed. And the mother finds out the thief was her own son. So instead of cursing, she reverses it to bless him. Now, their motivation is a prosperity. Their motivation is a blessing. They want to receive a blessing in their lives. But what do they do? They end up using the portion of silver to make graven image. Graven image is you take a wood and you carve it with a certain image, the idol, and you cover it with the silver. Molten image is just a, that you broil silver and melt it and with a certain image the whole thing they use make a silver idol so two idols they made but along with it there's an effort effort should belong to priests not to regular people especially from the tribe of Ephraim so they are trying to control everything they have an absolutely no idea what God said in the law, how they are able to worship God, to receive God's blessing. So they are doing their own ways apart from God's law. They have absolutely no interest what God says, what the Bible says, but they are doing it their own way. Even worshiping God, even trying to receive blessings from the Lord. It's very interesting. After he made all these and enshrined of all the idols and so forth and also chose at the beginning one of his sons as a priest and later he chooses a Levite to be the priest. But what the Bible says, what Micah says after what he has done, this is what he said. 17 verses 13. Mm. Book of Judges 17 verse 13. This is Micah saying, Then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing that I have a Levi to my priest. Now I know. Since I have done all this, I have a chosen Levi to be a priest. Now I know that's what he knows. I know God will do good for me. God will bless me. What does this teach us? This teaches us, as a Christians, we can do the same way. We can be so ignorant of God's word, and we don't care about what God says from the Bible, but according to my desire, according to my ways, I can create my own God. My own God. And I want to ask you this question to all of us. How do you view your God? It'll be so interesting. Every one of us, we have a certain view and certain knowledge of God. But every one of us has a particular perspective and knowledge of God. And if we come out and share who we think our God is, according to our own knowledge, my own knowledge, maybe the God whom we are serving may be very different from each person. In other words, God that American Christians created can be so different from 
the Indian Christians, how they view their God. If we don't anchor the knowledge of God according to the scriptures, then we can create our own God. We may not be using silver or gold, but with our mind or with our heart, and according to our own conviction, according to our own desire, we can create a God that is so far from the scriptures. You know when I get that threat in my mind? When I see some of the Christians, when they talk about what kind of God they serve, because we can heavily emphasize about the goodness and mercy and grace and love of God. Once I was traveling um, in, in a business trip to Korea when I was working for a secular company, and in the airplane, a lady was sitting right next to me, and I wanted to share the gospel. And I began to converse with this lady and talk about Jesus Christ. But apparently, she belonged to a, a heretic group. And as I talked about holiness of God, because, because of our sin, we end up and we are condemned. And she was asking me, are you telling me God the Father, loving, merciful God, will send us to hell? And I said, yes. How can you? Are you married? At that time, I, didn't, I was not married. No, I'm not married. Later on, if you become a father, you will understand what I'm trying to say to you. Our God is a loving God. He is love, which is right. He is love. And if you become a father, and when you look over your children, just because they become disobedient and they become rebellious, in no way you will ever think to punish them to eternal damnation and they will fall into hell and they will never be able to get out. No. No, our loving God will never send us to hell. It sounds so right. It sounds so godly. And whatever she's just saying, partially right. But is it biblical? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And this is a some way extreme case. But we also, apart from the scriptures, that's why it's so important for us to every day meditate and read the scripture and be able to understand and receive a revelation of who God is. Otherwise, we can be stuck with a one area of who God is. He's our creator. He's an infinite being for finer being with our knowledge and trying to understand him is almost impossible task, but whatever he has revealed himself from the scriptures that we can know, we can be assured that he is a true living God, according to what he said from the scriptures. It's not about how we feel. It's not about how that we say God is this way and that way. And because we don't have a proper understanding, when the trials comes and difficulty comes, and oftentimes we wrestle, we doubt God because we lack knowledge of who he is. Because how wonderful, merciful, loving God can allow such evil and such difficulty in my life and we try to condemn God without understanding properly. So, in many cases, sometimes Christians, because these are Israelites, these are God's chosen people, the story in the Bible is not about Gentiles, it's not about heathens, how they did a, such a horrendous acts before God or before one another. These are God's people. In a way, they are chosen God's people to them, God's words were given to them. But with a, such people, they acted in such a way. Even as a Christians, we can behave and create our own God, which can be so different from what God has revealed from the scriptures. And multiple times, repeatedly, from the history, that Christians and God's people did make such mistakes. And we know from the book of Exodus, Israelites, 
right after jo Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he didn't come down for many days, what did they do? They made a golden calf and said, you are God who delivered us from Egypt. Before golden calf, that's what they did. And through the, throughout the history of Israel, they repeatedly did that. Jer Jeroboam made an idol and Bethel and then and caused the people to worship them as their own God. Even in Christian history, although it was a Catholic, the clergy was so corrupted, they began to sell indulgence. Indulgence was sort of like a certificate. Whomever sins against his wife or what kind of horrendous sins that you, have, you may have committed, but you come before the priest and buy with the money certificate of indulgence, that is a temporary forgiveness of your sin. So no matter what kind of sin you sinned, what kind of crime you committed, you just come to priest and pay the money and buy indulgence and your sins are forgiven. That's how church corrupted themselves in such a way. When we hear that, how can that be? How can they be so far away from the scriptures? And yes, we can go that far. Today, Bible is so available, readily available to the hands of Christians, and we may not fall into such horrendous crime before God, but we can be far away from God who has revealed himself from the scriptures with our own experience, with our own emotion, with our own conviction, and create a completely different God and bow down before them. But worst thing is, now because I serve God this way, now because I made God this way, I know for now, for certain, that he will do me good and he will bless me. And when God doesn't bless us, then we are totally lost and we are totally confused and we condemn our God. I believe this is lesson. This is a lesson. Pastor Eddie mentioned that during early morning prayer when he talked about this portion, syncretism, mixture of different religion inside a church, worshiping God, but at the same time, there's a strange God in the midst of us, and we worship together. And the history has taught us the church fell into this sin repeatedly. And we need to really examine our life, even our church, whatever we do. Is it truly biblical? Is it truly what the Bible says? One example is electing deacons and elders. Sometimes we follow church's tradition. We have our own tradition. To become a, a deacon, you need to be older than 30 years old. And you need to go through the church programs and trainings. But the Bible says he has to be man of one wife and be able to rule his house. He's not the money lover. And he should be blameless, not only inside a church, but outside a church. Do we truly examine that person's quality or, or possibility of election according to the scriptures, or do we follow the church's tradition? And they are given so that we may be able to train our people and so that they may grow up to be the leaders, but something that we need to seriously consider and observe what we do in the church. Lastly, because we don't have much time tonight, one thing that I want to point out is this Levite, Later on, if we read 18 verse 30, if we can show this, the children of Dan, later on, the Danites, they wanted to acquire some more land because whatever they had it was too straight. So they ventured out to acquire some more land. On the way, they met the house of the Micah. Long story short, they stole all the idols from the house of Micah, even including Levite, and they took him and set him as a priest, and they began to worship all these idols from the house of Micah. So then they, they had this Levite 
to be the priesthood until they became captives of Assyrian kingdom. Now here, what it says is the children of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan. So finally, on verse 13 of chapter 18, this young boy who is a Levite, his name is mentioned. His name was Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. Now King James Version says Manasseh, but there is a, a, a scribal error from the manuscript and the King James Version uh, wrongfully translated or wrote it as a Manasseh, but some scholars say purposefully, uh, even from the manuscript, that they kind of tilted the character so that they didn't want to say it was a son of Moses because they didn't want to bring dishonor to the house of Moses because Gershom was a son of not Manasseh, son of Moses. So different translation from your Bible will have us as a son of Moses. What I'm trying to say is son of Gershom or son of Moses cannot be a priest. Only from Aaron's descendants can be Levi, I mean priest. So whatever they are doing was a they are doing apart from the scripture. Whatever fit, whatever seems to be good in their eyes, that's what they did. And thinking they are worshiping and they are serving God. And hoping God's blessings over their lives. But I believe, as we conclude, what God is trying to show is the Levites, the people, the group, who should be teaching God's law, who should be teaching the knowledge of God and service of God, and when they failed, that's what they got, the condition of the book of Judges. When the clergy and the pastors and the spiritual leaders, if, when they do not fulfill their role of leading God's people spiritually, teaching them the Bible properly, and praying for them when they fail. And their failure is reflected in the lives of Christians in much, much worse way. While I share this, I covet your prayers for the pastors. Please do pray for me and pray for the, all the pastors. Their lifestyle, their walk with the Christ and they're fulfilling God-given role and calling is so vital to your personal life and your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Let's all rise. No matter how this story is not fun to read and it's so dark, even from chapter 19 and on, there's another Levite who had a concubine. So two Levites' stories are very dark. 